ladies and gentlemen, Kitty Hawks. Good afternoon, everybody. I am very pleased to be introducing a discussion on a subject that's not only important to the Municipal Arts Society, but very important to me as a designer. Throughout its history, MAS has worked to preserve the finest attributes of our built environment while encouraging new projects that further enhance our city's urban fabric. MAS continually advocates for thoughtful, high-quality de design that makes New York a more dynamic and livable place for all. One example, for instance, has to do with the very building we're standing in, sitting in, in your case. <clears throat> in 2002, MAS asked a group of volunteers to stand in Central Park with black umbrellas to represent the size of the shadow that would have been cast by the original design of this building. As a result, the building was redesigned because the shadow was so egregious and so overwhelming. And it was the innovative and imaginative and somewhat humorous approach of MAS that got it done. And as a result, we are standing and sitting in one of the most elegant buildings in New York that has no negative impact as it originally did from its first massing. Another way we advocate for good design is through the annual Masterworks Awards, celebrating excellence in architecture and urban design. This year, the MAS Friends of the Arts will present the awards in a ceremony to be held on November 6th at Four World Trade Center, developed by our sponsor, Silverstein Properties. Four World Trade is the first building to be completed on the World Trade Center site, and we are really excited that we will be able to present our awards there before it officially opens. Please join us on the 6th. There are invitations in your tote bags. Through the Masterworks Awards and projects like the building of a new Penn Station, the rezoning of East Midtown, MAS provides the leadership to ensure such important developments add to our city's character while strengthening our economic competitiveness and capacity to thrive. That said, <clears throat> we all know too well that some of the development that takes place in our city is disappointing, to say the least. It doesn't enhance the neighborhood or the district. It's drab, mediocre, and forgettable, if only. Usually it's so big that you can't forget it. But there are developers and enlightened real estate leaders who engage with architects, designers, neighborhoods, and residents to build dynamic projects that leverage existing assets and contribute to the city as a whole. Ultimately, the results are better and the projects make our city better. How do we encourage developments that enrich and enliven our districts and neighborhoods? What are the challenges of collaborations between developers, planners, architects, and residents? How do we make first, the first priority of new developments the enhancement of our sense of place? How do we build a better New York? To discuss these issues, we are pleased to have Daily News real estate editor Mike Matt Chabon, who will moderate this in conversation with Tommy Craig, Simon Koster, Scott Reckler, and Mitch Rudin, developers who are grappling with these complicated questions across the city. Please join me in welcoming them all. Oh, sink into this. Thank you. Um, we're here at the Municipal Arts Society Summit, Municipal Art Society, another word for that could be design, all rolled into one. As you heard, um, the, the state of design has gotten much better in the city. This wasn't always the case. Uh, fortunately, we do have some enlightened developers here with us. And uh, Tommy, I'd like to start with you. You guys have been carrying the torch for quite a while with projects like the Lipstick Building and uh, 450 Lex, which now belongs to Scott, I believe. Um, <laughs> So what, what does Heinz see in the value of design, and how did you arrive at the projects you've done over the years? You might start by asking Scott, because I think for us the value of good design is measured in a couple ways. It starts with use type. For a commercial project, the basic measure at Heinz actually isn't return of capital. It is our success at renewing tenants over time. Uh, that ultimately is what leads to long-term value creation, which is the basis of our firm. Residential projects, I would say it's different. 
residential projects really are a merchant bill model. In New York, I would say better architecture, global architecture, mm -hmm. clearly with the kind of elastic pricing we've seen in the market is producing higher returns. But I would say fundamentally, uh, we're in our third generation at Heinz of Heinz family members. And uh, in permanent markets, New York's of course a permanent market, the real kind of measure of any project is it does it lead to future projects. So our ability to synthesize our private economic goals with additive work to the public sector has been very fundamental to the opportunity to continue to be selected to carry out the kind of projects we have the privilege of working on. So I mean, we were just talking about luck and you know, one project leading to another backstage. You guys are sort of the new kids on the block, um, but you, you're certainly very busy uh, converting old landmarks like the Walker Tower and creating new ones like well, a tower that will soon rise past the Empire State Building just behind us on 57th Street. What drives a JDS project? So for us, um, it's really simple in the office. It's good design is good business. Um, we've seen it in rental product, in condo product, in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, even in the South Florida market, um, that good design pays uh, in the short term and in the long term. So design for us is all about context. So you talk about Walker Tower, Steinway, um, another project is 435 West 50th Street. These are all projects that have uh, big architectural pedigree that from a design standpoint, we wouldn't want to fight at all. They're, they're a history of New York and they're something that should be kept and then rolled into a new project in the future as they sit. So in places where you don't have context, um, like 626 First Avenue, where we're redeveloping an entire block over by the FDR, um, the game is to create a new benchmark entirely. So if anyone's seen the renderings, we have two new towers clad in copper, uh, an architectural bridge between the two with a park sitting at the bottom beneath both towers. Um, for us, that's all about uh, a, brand, a brand new piece for the neighborhood, not just, not just playing with it. So how to, how to get that done um, in the JDS sense is that we don't have a problem dealing with the issues of uh, high design in that the, you know, people, people think there's upfront cost and added construction complexity. And we really have in-house construction teams and procurement groups that can deal with building almost anything. Um, they are not third-party construction managers. They're not owner's reps uh, or any of those iterations. They're just people that work directly for us that manage all our construction in-house and they build our buildings um, as if they're building their own home and they put a passion into it to get the whole thing done and make sure that what you see at the beginning of a project, what you're nurturing as you're designing a project and how you finish that project is all one seamless process. Right. So I think there's a, a real appreciation for quality there and I think Scott, mm -hmm. you as well, um, sort of maybe got to this before JDS, but uh, you, you've shown a real propensity for buying up uh, historic buildings in the city and really transforming them, um, like on Sixth Avenue, but I think even more notably projects like Stair at Lehigh and uh, some of your, your work in Flatiron. So I'm curious, preservation and, and uh, you know, development are often seen at odds. How do you make them the marriage work? Sure, but first of all, I jumped, I just wanted to say to Tommy, is uh, the one thing about Heinz, uh, they build great buildings, and same with Macklow, and some of these things, to your point, you know, when we buy a building that's a Heinz building or a Macklow building, they're built with timeless design and focus and infrastructure in the beginning, and so they have an, on, an ability to have continuity and still be very competitive as, as you Thank go forward, like 450 Lex. Um, one of the things, though, that we've tried to focus on is, uh, is redevelopment of, of classic buildings, irreplaceable assets that are in either uh, irreplaceable locations or iconic or historic in nature um, that for some reason have fallen into disrepair, whether there's a financial challenge that the previous ownership has had, uh, whether it was just something that's been neglected by uh, a tenant or a long-term tenant along the way that uh, hadn't really continued to invest and maintain the, the property uh, into the form that it, that it deserves. So think of it as a, uh, 
as a, a tarnished stone that we want to polish up and turn back into that precious gem uh, that, it, uh, that it could be. And so you know, one of the two of them that we're working on right now, uh, which are, are very compelling, one is 75 Rockefeller Plaza, uh, and the other is 237 uh, Park Avenue uh, that we bought over the last, uh, last year. And we were able to buy these assets at significant discounts to replacement costs because of the distress or the, uh, the, the lack of, uh, of care that it was going through. 75 Rock is a landmark building, great location, obviously, right looking over the plaza, uh, a building that's going to be completely vacated uh, by Time Warner in uh, July of 2014. And what we're going to do is gut the entire interior of the building, 650,000 square feet, um, and build a modern building inside of the historic shell of Rockefeller, the Rockefeller Center shell, obviously replacing the windows and everything that, that we can to maintain what it was. And we actually went back uh, into the 1940s when this was built and found the original photographs of what this looked like. And, and interesting that it's, it's landmarked and, and you can look at what it looks like today, it doesn't look like what it was originally designed or built as. And so we're trying to bring it back to what it was originally designed and built, built at. And even in the interior, trying to respect the materials that were used at Rock Center, carrying it through, but making it modern, taking what's now seven and a half foot ceilings, making them nine foot ceilings. Um, it's gonna be a, a LEED certified, gold LEED certified uh, building. We're gonna have a roof deck on the top uh, where you'll have a restaurant that you'll be able to look down at Rock Center and then south and then um, over uh, Central Park on the other side. So it's gonna be uh, you know, a fully amenitized modern building and the only one that's been modernized in, uh, in Rock Center uh, when it's all said and done, but again, respecting the character. Now, Mitch, you guys at Brookfield, you've done a little of everything. There's a similar project you're undertaking at the former World Financial Center, now Brookfield Place, but then again, you're also plenty busy uh, putting up Manhattan West. So I'm curious, how do you see the early properties in relation to the newer ones that Brookfield's done? Uh, there's a commonality to it. I, our, our focus, even though, as you indicated, it ranges from development to redevelopment, and we're in uh, eight different cities in the United States, is that our focus is on trophy or near-trophy assets. And to the extent that those are previously built projects, those are projects that we will move into the same category, similar as Scott has talked about, and uh, development, uh, on new development, as we're doing in Manhattan West, it's to move it, to bring it on lead gold uh, quality product of the equal of any in, in the city. Part of our focus has always been, and, and I joined two years ago after 20 years at another organization, and in addition to the people, what brought me over was the opportunity to, and as we previous speakers have talked about, a sense of place, was really to be part of reshaping part of New York. And uh, we, our seven and a half million square foot uh, mixed use project on the west side is going to be instrumental in reshaping that part of, of the west side of the city. Uh, and what we're doing at Brookfield Place as well, as we've seen uh, heavy focus and reorientation of a lot of downtown toward the, uh, toward the west side of that. And I also have the good fortune, uh, we just closed a large transaction in Los Angeles where we'll be the largest landlord in downtown LA, and we are similarly one of the two largest landlords in Houston, and now embarking on a plan to reshape the west side of Houston. So the boundaries of the city where developers would safely tread have certainly been shifting a lot, and I think you were talking about that just now for a while. People had sort of written off downtown. Um, the west side was certainly somewhere you wouldn't want to go. Uh, so starting with you, Scott, um, you know, as I mentioned, you, you've got a lot going on sort of in what we call Midtown South. It seems like it needs its own name almost now. It's become such a vibrant community for companies. What do you see driving that, that growth and what do you think could continue to push it forward? Sure, so yeah, I think we've seen over the last, um, uh, I would say three to five years, a, uh, a, a growth in the media and technology and idea-based economy in New York to a point where it's reached a critical mass that it's now become self-reinforcing, so that companies that want to be in the media and technology or, uh, uh, field need to be here because the workforce is here. And then more, what's happened now is because the company's here, more of the workforce comes and then more companies come. And so it's, they've, they've sort of have found themselves. And they have a different need for office space and different demands 
than what our traditional, let's call it financial service or professional service uh, companies would want. And we began to see that happening in 2010. And we invested about a billion and a half dollars in Midtown South with Starrett Lehigh, 620 Avenue of the Americas, which were buildings that had, uh, that really catered to those 21st century tenants, but had the character um, and, and types of, of amenities that a more uh, media and technology and idea-based type tenant would want, which would be, if you think about it, larger floor plates, um, higher ceilings, and ability to d densify uh, work in a more collaborative way. And there's, there's also a cluster effect that more of these types of tenants want to be near each other. And so as Midtown South with Google and Chelsea began to occur and, and starting heading west, that cluster effect took place and more and more companies want to be there. Now the reality is there's only so many buildings though in Midtown South. And so what you've seen in that marketplace is there was a structural shift in rents. So where rents used to be maybe 30 or $40 a square foot, it's now 60 or $70 a square foot and there's not that much. And so, uh, as you heard from your prior speaker, Lower Manhattan is actually gonna be a beneficiary of that in, in, a, in a different way, maybe not in terms of the, the types of the buildings, but you're starting to see that cluster effect and Connie Nass moving downtown, Group M uh, announcing that they're gonna be moving down to Lower Manhattan, and we're seeing more and more tenants have interest in Lower Manhattan. I think that would be another place like Midtown South that will have that definition of a, of a younger, more dynamic idea-based economy. It's interesting, you, we, we talk about people, you know, this movement sort of going south rather than north. Um, the deputy mayor was here earlier talking about the need to revive Midtown. Simon, you guys are, are doing a number of projects in Midtown and they're mm -hmm. predominantly residential, which I think even a decade ago we might not have seen. Mm -hmm. What do you make of the transformation happening specifically here on 57th Street? <laughs> so 57th Street is a really interesting um, case study that can be done in New York right now. So there, there's a handful of things that make 57th Street interesting. And that is, uh, the first one is that 57th Street is the end of uh, the special midtown zoning. So you can actually build tall buildings north of 57th Street in the first place. Um, the second one is even if you can build a tall building somewhere else in the city, the question is why would you? Um, north of 57th Street, uh, south of Central Park, um, I don't think anyone would disagree that the views looking north into Central Park are simply fantastic, probably some of the best in the city that you can find. Um, and then the third factor, which everyone understands really well at this point, is that the residential market has um, reached levels that nobody, uh, nobody would have expected. And that makes projects like this really um, financially feasible for the first time uh, in a long time. So I think we're going to see more and more of these um, sleek, tall residential towers, uh, particularly in this area and then uh, in different parts of the city as well as, as the prices reach uh, that's a, that, that point of sustainability from the project cost standpoint. Yeah. Tommy, I'm curious to hear from you about your downtown residential tower since Tommy suggested that um, you might not want to build tall everywhere. What's driving a 56-story tower in Tribeca, a neighborhood not particularly known for that sort of thing? Yeah, this will be our third project, I would say, south of 14th Street. We did two neighborhood projects, 40 Mercer, one Jackson. Um, it's a project we've been involved with for a couple of years now uh, through our relationship with Whitehall and Dune. Uh, it's had um, an extraordinary, I would say, uh, path, uh, very emblematic of what's happened in the city. Uh, the project was not underway 12 months ago, and we're 85% sold at this point at price points that average close to $3,000 a foot. What's driving that? A number of things. Um, lower Manhattan is appealing. Uh, there is a real sense that uh, people are gonna value that neighborhood, the proximity to the employment. Everything that's driving, I would say, 56 Leonard is probably also driving Condé Nast to the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. It's a live, work, play in an historic district. I want to come back to your other question, though, about um, you know where's the pattern of growth. I think we touched on both of them, um, but I want to bring it back to Midtown East. It's interesting. Um, we have a very definitive point of view about the path of growth. Our first project in New York was the Lipstick Building. It was premised really on a notion of Park Avenue expanding to the east, specifically in the vicinity of City Corp, which was really the only major building built in the second half of the 1970s, about a half dozen buildings in that neighborhood. Uh, in part because of policy change beginning in 1982, there was an intention 
to shift growth to the west, and it's now going to the south. We're now working on two projects, one at Seven Brown Park, which is under construction, a second at One Vanderbilt, which is directly opposite Grand Central. And I often ask myself, of those two projects, which public asset means more today? Proximity to a public space and a park in the path of growth, or the opportunity to be adjacent to a transportation hub? And it's interesting, a generation later, um, I think, for all the reasons Bob Steele mentioned, um, Midtown East really needs not only transit infrastructure, public space, and it needs the benefit uh, of a mixed-use community, as the current zoning provides. But it's a remarkable thing to believe in one generation that an area that was once considered congested you know, looks like it's no longer a place that users prefer. Mitch, I'm curious, since you, you guys have a number of properties in out, well, downtown and, and on the west side, um, outside the Midtown core, um, I know groups like MAS have expressed interest, or concern on your behalf that uh, Midtown East could somehow cannibalize your, your, your work and those of your colleagues like related Silverstein who, who are also undertaking projects in those areas. Is it something that gives you pause at all? No, we're, we're certainly not against Midtown zoning. Um, we do believe strongly though in the uh, Sunrise provision, uh, which would limit its start its effectiveness in 2017. Uh, I think we, the city, a number of developers, ourselves are included, are vested in the success of the west side and in addition to downtown. And even though the new construction that's coming online now represents a relatively small percentage of the inventory in New York, one, two percent a year over the next few years, it's still for this city a lot uh, relative to what we've seen in the last 20 years. Um, this rezoning may well be one of the last major initiatives we see from this administration. So sort of just working our way down the line here, starting with you, Simon, I'm curious, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing, biggest real estate challenge? You know, we'll leave stop and frisk out of it, but what's the biggest challenge facing uh, the next administration, whoever the mayor might be, and what, what sort of solutions do you see, and how does the real estate industry play a role in that? So... Not surprisingly, there's a lot of unknowns, right? And that, that's, that's a given. Um, but the interesting piece is going to be how the, the public sector and, and the public in general is always going to need to have a place in the conversation. And there's a lot of conversations about, there's a lot of talk with the new administration about um, shifting the balance or um, bringing the public more into the conversation or less into the conversation. And I think the biggest piece the administration uh, needs to look to is, is to keep that um, equation between private development and public interest balanced. Um, and how they do that, we'll see. I, I think there's two things. I think the, the first and, and most important is quality of life and public safety. I think one of the things that drives a city is that people feel comfortable moving from around the world to come live here, to come visit here, to come work here, and uh, maintaining that public safety focus and that quality of life uh, is critical. And the second thing is affordability, just we were talking about $3,000 apartments, and affordability, not just affordability for uh, you know, affordable housing affordability, but I would say young professional affordability, affordability for professionals to be able to live in New York City, even not just Manhattan, but even now the boroughs that are getting priced at higher levels without being priced out um, too far out. Now, the good news is, you know, part of what you're seeing with some of this is that new parts of the markets in New York City are opening up because young professionals are having to go further out to actually find housing that they can afford, which are making some of these communities more vibrant and may lead to you know, organic growth that would have taken decades uh, to happen if we were trying to do it from a public planning perspective. So it's interesting. I guess stop and frisk might actually be a real estate issue. Tommy? Um, yeah, obviously. Not go there. <laughs> right. <laughs> I just, I'll reinforce what Scott said about quality of life and public safety. Um, as an essential precondition. Uh, but I think the next mayor um, is going to have to create an economic model that supports long-term job growth. I think employment is the biggest source of dignity for, for many, many individuals. 
and also provide a way to make sure that the wealth is more widely distributed, that the social contract ultimately you know, provides opportunity at all ends of the spectrum. And we don't have a model right now that deals with sustainable long-term employment growth as well as income inequality. If there is a way to think about affordable housing, you know, not so much as a driver of economic growth, but a beneficiary of economic growth. Uh, I think we're going to have a model that allows New York to continue to live in the political bubble that has made it so different than Washington, D.C., and that's very important. Mitch? Yeah. Well, sorry. I echo those thoughts, so now I'm sitting here trying to, to, to what to add to it. Uh, but I would say that uh, although they've been demonized to a degree, uh, the financial services institu uh, institutions are so central to this city, and the, their health and our ability to retain them and let them grow here as opposed to other places is central to every one of those things. Um, there's a very significant, because you, you, you think of the big banks and you think of investment bankers or the, you know, the most senior offers being chauffeured around, but when they're announcing layoffs, those are the lay they're laying off the middle class, and there's a multiplier effect that is significantly greater in the financial services inst industry than any other industry in this city. Now, fortunately, New York, is fabulously diverse, both its, its people and its industry, and we see tech and healthcare uh, and other professional service and knowledge industries that are coming along to replace it. But that's a big gap. I mean, it's not by accident that we changed the name of World Financial Center downtown uh, to Brookfield Place. It was done to promote us. Those who know us know we're a fairly low-key company, and we debated a whole group of names. Uh, but it was done because the tenants that we were talking to and the tenants that we're talking to now are not in the financial services institution. And as a predicate to pursuing those discussions, they actually insisted that we change it. They didn't quite care what we changed it to, but an advertising agency, law firm, uh, people in the consumer product fields just did not want to be in something called a World Financial Center. Interesting. Scott, um, since you've got the governor's ear and perhaps the next mayor's, I figured I'd ask you a question near and dear to the hearts of the folks here at MAS. What do you see happening in the coming years with Moynihan Station and all the plans around that? Is this a stop and frisk question again? Yeah. <laughs> tough one. The, uh, it's a tough guy to answer that. You know, I, I think a couple of things. One, I, I applaud MAS for actually focusing on it and making something, some bold visions, because I think it's important to always have bold visions and try to um, you know, be creative and not uh, just think small. Uh, that being said, I think there are incremental opportunities that as you're thinking bold that people should be focused on. I mean, and, and as it relates to Moynihan and Farley, uh, phase one is actually happening right now. There's 250 to $270 million being invested there, and a lot of it's underground, but you're gonna start seeing shortly some of that come above ground. Uh, some of the work that's happening over at, at um, Hutchin Yards is ensuring that we're going to have the, the benefit for the Gateway Project to continue, which may, again, add more uh, capital and money flowing in here. Um, and so, I, and then even in Farley, there's some commercial opportunities that are actually out there right now, and tenants that have expressed interest in that, because all of a sudden you think about that floor plate, that character, that may offer opportunities, again, to rethink about Penn Station and, and, and how to, uh, to take advantage of that. So I would say, I would think bold. I think incrementally to try to continue to, to make the experience better, though, and not just relate on wait on what I call the blockbuster movie type opportunity. But there may be one, right? Ten years ago, fifteen years ago, I'm not sure we all envisioned what we're seeing on the west side today in, in Hutchin Yards. Um, but it's happening, and because of that, there's new things that are being developed, and there may be other things that happen that give us an opportunity uh, with with Penn Station to try to uh, enhance that experience. It's clearly. You know, it's almost I like make it uh, similar to our airports. You know, here we are, this incredible city, and here's this big gateway, transportation gateway that, we, that so many of our citizens rely on, and it's not of, the, of the, uh, the stature that it should have. And I think in both cases, we've got to bring them to the 21st century, but it's not going to be something that I think is going to get done overnight. 
Simon, we're, we're here talking about the, the boom on the west side and here on 57th Street. Mm -hmm. What do you see driving the market now? And um, as we look at you know, things going on in Washington, things going on in China, the mayor's out there saying he wants all the billionaires in the world in town. Is this, is this market <laughs> sustainable? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky question, right? I mean, who knows, OK? <laughs> Um, but the, Good answer. Uh, no, who knows? It, it's it's, it's, it's the answer. only answer. Um, but I think the interesting piece is going to be playing what's um, what's certainly going to happen in the next how, however long the, um, this cycle lasts, um, which is kind of going back to the uh, what Scott was talking about on the west side, for example. So these are game changer projects, uh, be it Hudson Yards or Penn Station, when it eventually happens. Um, and that's going to obviously have an impact on the project itself. And, uh, but really, that's going to change um, all the neighborhoods around it. All right? And there, there's going to be a pushing, uh, there's going to be a pushing, rippling effect into Hell's Kitchen. Um, I'm not sure Chelsea can get uh, much more expensive, um, but maybe it can. Um, and then it's, it's going to go north from there. And then you're going to see the ripple effect go out into the boroughs as well. So places like Gowanus um, and downtown Brooklyn you know, we, th there's a lot of development planned for downtown Brooklyn, and, and that's a great thing. Uh, and that's going to continue to go. So really looking forward to all of it. Tommy, you've, you've been through a number of these cycles. I'm just curious uh, what you. Thanks for dating me. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, you know, where, where do you see things going? And uh, perhaps what lessons have you learned from the last uh, boom and bust that you're, you're trying to implement now? You know, in many ways, um, I'm very mindful that the work I do, development in New York, it's a business by exception. Uh, the reality is um, the ability to match global capital with local space market conditions is something that occurs not with frequency long-term trend for speculative development in New York uh, on a commercial basis is really not positive. We're developing at about a third the rate of growth we did in the 80s, a third of what occurs now in London. And so I would say most new projects, if you look at them from the bottom up, require a rent premium anywhere from 20 to 50 percent. The number of users that can afford to pay that, very finite. The number of capital sources that are willing to place economic bets on that basis at scale also fairly finite. The irony that I think we have in one of our projects, Seven Bryant Park, I see our partner here, Elizabeth Prop, it's predicated on a notion of scarcity. And scarcity as a value is antithetical to growth. And if New York wants to be an aspirational city, as it's always been, as Roger so, I thought, eloquently put it, looking back over a couple hundred years, um, we're going to have to continue to recognize that um, the development business is part of creating a physical experience in New York that complements the social model and is ultimately something, if it's done well, provides expansive opportunity for everybody. Uh, but it is getting to be a harder formula to carry out, I just look at our firm. We tend to be emblematic of the trends that surround us. And most of our work in the last 20 years has been high-end residential mm -hmm. and build a suit, which says the commercial development market is a spot market that only works periodically. Mm -hmm. And so the premise in my mind of why Midtown East should uh, support, and, and clearly I'm not objective about this, is projects need to be ready to go when those conditions are available in the private sector that allow them to go from planning into execution. I would never underestimate that. It's a false confidence trap to think that policy alone is going to drive these projects. Well, here's hoping the city keeps soaring. And if it does, I'm sure you have these guys to thank for it. So let's give them a round of applause.